There we go. All right. Break a leg, Greg. Thank you. Hello and welcome. We will be starting at 6.05. We're just waiting for people to show up. So we'll be starting in five minutes. Hello everyone. For those of you who have not heard, we will be starting in about four minutes. Welcome everybody. We will be starting in about three or four minutes. Okay, it's 6.05, so let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Master Gardener webinar. 
Tonight, we will be talking about how to prep for your summer veggie garden. Thank you so much for joining us and let's get started. I'm going to pass it over now to our coordinator, Terry. Hi, Terry. Hi there. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us on this uh, nice spring day. I um, am excited to get my uh, soil ready for summer vegetables as well. Um, just to let you know, all participants will be um, muted and will have their video turned off during the presentation. For any questions you might have during the presentation, please use the Q&A icon to post your questions and then we will address them. Um, please don't use the chat for your questions. This event will be recorded for educational or promotional use by the University of California and it will be um, posted on our YouTube channel as well as the libraries. Uh, closed captioning is available tonight. And uh, finally, we will have a handout available to you at the end of the class. And we'll talk about um, that a little bit more later. Okay. Gonna get the next slide here. There we are. Okay, just a reminder of our mission as master gardeners. It is to extend research-based knowledge and information on home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable landscaping practices to the residents of Contra Costa County. Um, so we are here for you, and this is one of our ways of reaching you. And the next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna get down to it. And um, this webinar is going to be presented by our UC Master Gardener, Greg Letts. Greg comes from uh, more than 30 years of experience in specialty outdoor industry as a retailer, a manufacturer's representative, and a business owner. He became a UC Master Gardener in 2019 he volunteers weekly at our garden in um, Wallet Creek, and he currently coordinates the watering team. Greg also assists at our Ask a Master Gardener uh, tables. That's another way that we provide information to Contra Costa County. And um, these are at farmer's markets, as well as some other places. And he's also a participant on the executive leadership team. He um, has a home garden of many years and it includes year round vegetables, small fruit trees and potted citrus trees. So welcome uh, Greg Letts and thank you. All right, thank you, Terry. And here we go. So um, I'm gonna talk about summer veggies and how to prep your garden uh, really with it, uh, focusing on the way we do it at our garden in Walnut Creek. And um, when, I, when I say our garden, I mean the master gardener demonstration garden located in Walnut Creek on Shadelands, not my home garden. And I'd like to start off with a poll. to get an idea of people's experience level. So is this your first time, been at it a few years, been doing it a long time, could be actually on the other end of this camera. Okay, so it looks like a lot of experience out there. Half of you have been at it a few years and um, and uh, more than 30% have been at it for many years. That's great. Okay, so what I'm gonna go over tonight um, is is going to stay really grounded, talking about bed prep and soil prep. And so 
what you can be doing now in the preseason, assuming you were all at our great tomato plant sale the last two weeks here in Walnut Creek, um, and you, you have a tray of plants ready to go in the ground, what prep could you be doing now? And then I'm gonna talk about what to do in season, how to protect your plants and how to, and, and how, how to protect the soil and maintain your beds. And then a few thoughts on post-season, what to do when your summer crops are done. What do you, where do you go from there? What I'm not gonna talk about, um, cause we already have great talks on that on our YouTube page. Um, the address for that is Coco MGUC. That's our YouTube channel. Um, I saw a question already in the Q&A about fertilizers and amendments. I'm not really gonna go into that in any detail tonight. Um, we've, got, we've got a great talk on that that's already available on YouTube. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about irrigation, just some basic principles, but not about how to set up a, a water system. We've got, we've got a talk on that, and as well as talks on planning and planting your plants. So first off, I wanna start with a little historical context. So uh, two Christmases ago, I ran across these two books that um, one written in 1911, one written in 1940, and it both of them talked about soil fertility. One is called Farmers of 40, 40 Centuries, and it was about um, a University of Wisconsin uh, professor's studies in going through China, Korea, and Japan, and how they maintain soil fertility despite living on the same plot of ground, usually having less than two acres, and have that be remain fertile for generations. Um, and then a related book written by an English uh, ad advisor to India in 1940 called An Agricultural Testament, where he uh, had the same questions. What were they doing in India that they might be able to bring back to Great Britain? And I know you're thinking, so, okay, this is how you spend your Christmas vacation? Yeah, well, yeah, it kind of is. So off we go. Um, so the lessons from those two books, the author of the Farmers of the 40 Centuries could see the Dust Bowl coming to the US, written in 1911, and was looking for solutions. They were already seeing um, depleted soils in Eastern farms despite them being much bigger than they were in the Asian countries. The US farms were typically 20 acres, averaging about 20 acres, um, and looking for solutions for that. In uh, an agricultural testament, that author saw what happened in the US with the Dust Bowl and did not want to ha that to happen to Great Britain. And so what possible solutions could he find in India that, that um, would help them out. And it really, in, in both books, it came down to the same thing. It's maintaining soil fertility by aggressively adding organic matter from many sources. In the Asian countries, they were shaving clover off the hillsides, carting it down in baskets, and then tucking it into rice paddies, manually tucking it into the ground. And then, in, uh, and then also moving silt out of the canals to, up onto the banks and then, and then spreading it across their uh, agricultural fields to, to add fertility to the soil. Um, they had their children um, following oxen carts and follow to, to gather up uh, manures that they could add to their compost piles and add to their soil as well. So um, really they describe it as not a stick or a twig or a leaf going to waste um, to build fertility back into this organic matter back into the soil. And they were doing the same, something similar in India, but uh, instead of it going straight into the soil, they had, a, they had something called the indoor process where they would dig these large trenches and compost um, animal manures, 
and all kinds of green material uh, in these large composting areas and let that break down until it um, was ready to be applied on their fields. And so that's how they were able to maintain that soil fertility. And we were doing nothing like that in the US. So um, what enabled them to do to have is longevity of production without relying on additional fertilizers. Fast forward a hundred years. So this is a brochure, a pamphlet that was put out by the USDA about 10 years ago. And it's called Farming in the 21st Century, a Practical Approach to Improve Soil Health. And it covers the same points that these authors talked about 80 and 100 years ago. Um, and I, I realize this is too small to read here. So um, the key points are, and, and that pamphlet is, is uh, in the resource page after you complete the survey at the end of the talk, that, that survey will, that uh, resource page will be there and it has a link to that document. So the key points are managing soil health by disturbing the soil less, meaning not tilling, diversifying the crops that go into the, uh, that are planted there to get a variety of roots to attract a variety of insects and a, a variety of benefit organism um, through crop diversity, keeping the soil covered as much as possible. So some, some speakers will call it armoring the soil where you're protecting soil from the weather, from wind and rain, erosion, uh, compaction, um, and so protecting that soil as much as possible. And then having growing living roots in the ground year round. There's kind of a myth out there about fields have to rest. Fields have, uh, you have to rest garden after planting it all summer. No, what you want to do is have that soil active and engaged year round if you can, and it will it will enliven the soil, it will enrich the soil, and um, it'll be healthier and you'll get better production from it. So there's a quote in that uh, in that pamphlet, which I think is it's kind of strong for a government document, but here goes. Tilling the soil is the equivalent of an earthquake, hurricane, tornado, and forest fire occurring simultaneously to the world of soil organisms. Simply stated, tillage is bad for the soil. And that was in the first publication of this about 10 years ago. So you say to yourself, well, what does that mean to me? I'm just looking to grow a few tomatoes and peppers. Um, I'm not farming, I don't have a tractor. Um, what does this mean to me? Well, what it'll mean to you is less work. So you'll spend less time prepping your beds each year. Um, it's less expensive. If you're using less fertilizers, you've got fewer, you've got fewer inputs to pay for there. You'll you, you end up using less water, which is very important these days. And in the end, you'll end up with healthier soil which will mean healthier plants, which will mean healthier produce. So let's do a few definitions. If you've watched a number of our talks, you've seen this before. Um, soil, what is it? How do we define it? So soil is made up of minerals, organic matter, air, and water. And the percentages are roughly 45% minerals, Minerals being essentially broken down rock down into anything from pebbles to sand to silt to clay. 5% um, organic matter roughly. And then 25% air and water. So the way I kind of look at this is half the soil is solid and half of it is air and water, is air and water passing through it, through the solids. How do we define organic matter? This is right out of the Master Gardener Handbook. So 
material derived from plant and animal residues in various stages of decomposition. So here's a tale of two soils. The soil on the left is a shovel full from our garden in Walnut Creek. And the soil on the right is a, a plowed field I stopped by along Highway 80, but you can see that anywhere along the farmlands on Highway 80 or down Highway 5 or 99 in California. Um, the soil on the right, you can see it's aggregated, it holds together. You can see it's kind of it's kind of clumpy and holds together. You can see it's alive. There's one earthworm there that uh, was too slow to get out of the way of the picture. The other one's ducked out quickly. Um, you can see it's very dark and rich. And uh, some people will describe uh, rich soil or good soil as moist chocolate cake. And it does kind of look like that, very rich looking. The soil on the other hand, on the right side is very tan, very pale, very sandy. Um, it would not clump together. And in digging in it a little bit, I really didn't see much life in it. So it ends up being kind of a kind of a growing media once chemical fertilizers are introduced. So with that, let's start looking at some of the steps in prepping. Again, this is the process we go through at our garden. So what we do is we clear existing material, whether that's plants that were in the ground from the year from the season before, or whether it's a cover crop that um, was grown in the given bed, or could be weeds. We don't have many weeds these days, but um, but but mostly cover crop and previous crops. So we'll clear that. We'll aerate the soil if needed. We don't really do much of that anymore. We'll amend the soil as needed. We'll top, top dress with compost, and then we'll double check the moisture before planting. So clearing the existing material. In the, the picture in the center there is a bed of fava bean plants. And so they grow very large and lush, um, and we use it as a cover crop. We don't let it mature into fruiting, into, into a bean state. Um, what we want is the nitrogen nodules that are on those roots to stay in the soil. And so when that plant starts flowering and then developing fruit, it starts pulling that nitrogen up. And we, we wanna leave that in the soil for our own planting. So what we'll be doing is chopping that down. There's two ways we can go on that. It can go to our compost bins. These are actually the compost bins at my house. Um, we have a whole composting area at the garden. Um, compost in place where we're gonna chop it up and put it right down on top of the soil. Our choice between the two tends to be timing. So ideally we'd like to leave that to compost in place and, and let all that work that's done by micro and macro organisms be done right there in the bed. Um, but sometimes we're looking to flip a bed in a day. And so we will take off that green matter and it'll go to over to our composting area. Um, and I don't know if I said it at the start, but we're not pulling these plants. We cut them off at the ground level, leaving the roots in the ground to decompose. And so here's the steps for that composting in place. Chop it up relatively small. Pieces are probably one to three inches. Chop it up relatively small, spread it out evenly on top of the bed, add a layer of compost on top of that, maybe an inch or so, and then we cover it with burlap. And I just got this question on Instagram on our page the other day. What's the burlap for? Well, we use the burlap to um, keep the moisture in and keep the sunlight out. And so what'll happen is it'll stay much moister underneath there. 
And if there's any plant stems that are thinking about continuing to sprout, that won't happen because we've shut off the light there. You can do this mulching with other materials. You could do it with leaves if you put them on three or four inches thick or straw. Um, but we find that doing it with burlap bags is a really neat and tidy way to do it. So we can stack them right on and peel them right off and then we, um, and then we reuse them. So the next step is aerating the soil if it's needed. So what we don't wanna do is get in there and turn the soil over. Um, what, you're, what you're doing when you do that is you're disrupting all that structure that's been put in place by the earthworms and everyone else that's kind of burrowing through that soil, um, the air and water channels that have been created over the course of the season. You'd be knocking all that down if you're digging up the soil and flipping it over. The other thing that happens is any dormant weed seeds that could be in there, you're exposing them to, to air and sunlight and moisture that um, could have them sprout. So we don't wanna do that. The reason you'd wanna aerate the soil is if you're not getting decent water percolation there. So um, on the left, we've got a broad fork, which is what we used to do. On the right, we've got just a standard garden fork, which is probably what you'd be using at home. Um, back in the original days of the garden, we would use we used to double dig, and essentially what that doing is is digging out a trench of soil there, say putting it in a wheelbarrow, mixing it with some kind of amendments like compost or something else, and then putting it back in the bed. In doing that, you're just you're destroying all the structure that's been created. So we're, if we're gonna broad fork, we're doing it just to improve the water percolation. An easy way to check that um, is dig kind of a shallow trench, fill it with water. If the water percolates right in, you really don't have to do much other aeration for that. You should be okay. Um, and you can do the same thing with your garden fork on the right side. The way to operate the broad fork is you step on that crossbar and pull the red arms back towards you. And so it really just kind of slices the soil. It's not turning the soil. What we do want to avoid is using a rototiller. That, that goes back to that original quote from the USDA there. So you're just chewing everything up if you're using a rototiller. Now, there are instances where it, it, it it, you know, if it's a brand new garden you're putting in and that soil is hard pan clay, which we can get in this area, in this county, um, a rototiller might be really your only choice. When our garden in Walnut Creek was first started 12 years ago, the, the hard pan soil was so hard there that the rototiller actually bounced off it. The blades wouldn't penetrate. Um, so that's an instance you're gonna need to use a rototiller to, to break that soil up just to get started, allow water to percolate in and loosen the whole thing a little bit. That when, when, that, when the, our garden was first started, the soil was so hard they had to use an auger to drill the holes to put in the fruit trees. So, um, the uh, this may be useful for maybe the first season or two if you're doing a brand new bed, but after that, I, I would avoid it if you can. You want to let the soil mature and develop on its own. So our next step is amending the soil, and. As you'll hear in many master gardener talks, we recommend starting with a soil test. I know they can be kind of expensive, somewhere 50 or $100, but um, how many bags of $20 fertilizer are you gonna save if you don't have to amend? So um, what we typically find in this county is that our soil can be a little light on nitrogen, but tends to be okay on potassium and phosphorus. So do we really need to add that stuff? We may not, but a soil test is gonna tell you that. It's kind of like going to the doctor and saying, just give me all the pills. Well, you may not need 
any of these pills? Well, yeah, just give them all to me anyway. I'm just going to take them all. So um, if we don't have to do that, we don't want to do that. We're going to, we want the, the soil to work on its own and let the microorganisms in the soil develop it for us. So typical amendments or additional amendments can be compost or manures. We use a lot of compost uh, at our garden. We don't really use any manures. Um, kind of the challenge with using say horse manure or cow manure is you really have to know your sources well um, to know what they've been eating, to know what the corrals or the perimeters of the corrals have been sprayed with or the fields have been sprayed with. Um, you want to know all that stuff. And so we, as a general rule, don't use manures. We, we add a little to the compost we make sometimes, but that's usually only very mature manure that's been sitting at least six months, better yet a year. So when we do use fertilizers, we tend to use an all-purpose organic. Um, we follow the directions on the package exactly how it says to do it. Um, so for instance, with a really heavy feeding plant, like for instance, tomatoes, they may say to put in, uh, say, two tablespoons in that, in that hole and stir it around before planting the plant. Um, and we really follow exactly what it says there. So um, a little more is not better, a lot more is even worse. <laughs> So uh, follow the directions on the package. And so you can see on the right, if we're kind of generally fertilizing a bed, we will um, broadcast it as it shows there. And for the fertilizer we use, it's eight cups to go on a hundred square foot bed. So you can look at it, it and it's really just a dusting. So, um, and if that's what it calls for, that's all we do. Because you don't want to do this. This is what happens with an, um, an over-fertilized uh, citrus tree. We actually had a case um, at the garden, the sale two years ago, where a guy came in and bought eight or 10 plants, took them home and planted them right away. He came back to us a week later and said, I don't know what happened, all my plants died. And the, uh, so we started asking him some questions. How did you water it? Okay, he was watering it properly. Um, how did you prep it? He prepped it fine. Okay, what kind of, how did you fertilize it? He says, well, I, I, I spread one bag of fertilizer over the bed. So the typical bag is three pounds. Um, his bed was half the size of what this, our beds are, where we use just eight cups. So, you know, of course he burned his plants. So. Follow the directions on the package and you'll be much better off. Just to briefly touch on the numbers that are on there. So um, the first number is nitrogen, the second number is phosphorus, the third number is potassium, and that's a uh, percentage by weight. So it kind of makes sense. So just the nitrogen, one way to think of these things is nitrogen is what sends the plant up, phosphorus is what sends the plant down, and potassium is what sends the plant around, kind of de developing fruit and flowers. So for a starter fertilizer, we're less concerned about plant growth to start. We want to get good roots going, and we're certainly not concerned with fruiting at that point. So 462 kind of makes sense. Some people want to use just a balanced fertilizer, keep it simple. So basic 555. Um, and then just for contrast, I show a bloom fertilizer where you're not concerned with plant growth. So just three in nitrogen, but you are concerned with good putting down good roots and um, getting good flowering or fruiting to kick in. Um, so real heavy there with 2020. Okay, so at, at that point, we're ready to top, top 
dress the, the beds with compost. So you can see on the left, we've got that dusting of fertilizer put down. And we wanna put like one to two inches of compost down. And some people will lightly rake it again in. We don't, we wanna disturb the soil as little as possible. So we will put on those two wheelbarrow loads of compost and just rake it smooth. And then we'll check the moisture and we'll be ready to plant. So when, when checking the moisture, we wanna start with moist soil uh, and we wanna in both the ground and in the plant you'll be planting. Um, Cause what, what'll happen is it'll, re, it'll seek equilibrium either way. So you go to plant uh, um, a well-watered plant in dry ground, um, it's gonna, tend to whip that moisture out away from the plant. And the other key point is we wanna be watering the soil, not the plants. So we use drip irrigation on our beds. Um, it's really the best system for getting the water where it needs to be, right on top of the soil. Um, and so we wanna be watering the soil because we want those roots to grow as full and as far as they want to. And if you're, just putting a, holding a hose at the stem of the plant, or you just got a little emitter there doing that, that's not gonna happen. That's not gonna do that. It will seek moisture wherever the moisture is. And so if we water the whole bed, um, our, we're gonna have better plants. Um, you can kind of do the same thing with sprinklers, though they're the le really the least efficient method. I know none of us do this, but we've seen neighbors that have sprinklers spraying the street or water run into the street. You know, ideally, we don't want to be doing that. Um, we want to put the water where it needs to be and and drip and and actually hand watering um, are the two ways to do that. If you're if you're watering by hand, it's a very intentional way to do it because you're looking at the whole bed checking to see what needs water and, and it's time consuming, but you're going over the whole thing um, and making sure it gets the water it needs. Uh, and then really the most important point of all these on the moisture of the soil is regardless of your watering method, it's not a set it and forget it. We'll hear this once in a while at, at uh, farmer's market tables at our Ask Master Gardener tables. Well, someone will say, well, yeah, my watering's fine. I've got timers. My drip irrigation's fine. I just, it, it's, it's on a timer. Well, yeah, but do you know that timer's set right? Do you know it's getting water where it needs to be? You really don't. So at our garden, we will, we will randomly check beds every week and adjust the time as needed every week. Um, because I mean, if you just think of our, our weather in the last month, We've had some sunny days. We've had some almost warm days. We've had some pouring rain. We've had some wind. If you're just setting it for the season, that's not gonna be good enough to water properly. So how do we check that wa water moisture, that soil moisture? There's a couple ways to do that. You can use a moisture meter, and that's got a graded scale on it um, that will go from dry to wet. And the way it the way it uh, measures that is it measures the conductivity of the soil. The wetter it is, the more uh, conductivity it has. And so those work pretty well, but you can't really see what's going on in the in the soil. So my preference is the other two methods. So you can check it by hand, where dig down six inches or so in the soil, pull out a, a, a ball of soil and, and see how wet it is. So create a ribbon in your hand, like shown there, and squeeze it together. And if it's moist enough, it should hold together. If it's too wet, you'll be able to squeeze water out of it. And that's a really simple test. So it's moist enough, it holds together. If it squeezes out water, it's too wet. Um, probably my favorite of the three is to use a soil probe. 
it does, it's similar to, to creating a ribbon by hand. But what you're doing is you're taking a core sample, depending on how big your soil probe is. This is a little one foot one that I use at home. We've got an 18 inch one at, at our garden, but you, you, you twist it down into the soil water sample. And so what you do there, it, what you're hoping for is to have consistent moisture down that whole uh, so soil sample there. That's ideal. So, but say for instance, the first three or four inches are dry and then it's only wet down on the bottom two inches. Well, that's, that's telling you the top of your soil is drying out. You may need to water more frequently. On the other hand, if just the top two inches of the soil is wet and everything below it is dry, that's telling you you're not watering deeply enough. You may be watering frequently enough for, for short root plants like lettuce or cilantro or something like that. But you're not watering deep enough for your deep root plants. You're not getting it down to where the root ball is. And so the other thing to consider is uh, crop diversity. And so the only time you see monocrops is from man's hand, right? So fields of sunflower, fields of corn, fields of soybeans. And what happens with that is you attract all the pests that are um, worst for that that crop, you get fewer beneficials there because they are, can be attracted to all kinds of different plants. And you, you only attract certain organisms in the soil for those plants. So that's what happens with monocropping. And ideally we want to make the planting as diverse as possible. So, while we at our, so in this, this is our family, but we call our family bed at our garden. It's one bed that we kind of set up, like, let's say you've got a hundred square feet at home. You've got a five by 20 area and that's all you, that's what you're going to plant. Um, what can you get in there? And so we plant a really diverse array of crops in there. So you can see this in this small picture, we've got red and green lettuce. We've got, I think that's garlic in there. We've got uh, Swiss chard in there. And I can't tell what that is up the right side. That's something else different again. Um, but we'll really put a bunch of different things in there. Um, so you attract all kinds of beneficials. You've got all kinds of root depths there that can uh, feed the soil after the plants come out. Um, it, it, much greater diversity ends up being healthier soil. And so to give you an idea of some of that root variety, um, so like the little shallow roots of lettuces only go down six inches or a foot, where you look at tomatoes, those roots can be a couple feet wide and three or four feet deep. So um, you wanna be watering deeply enough for deeper plants if that's what you've got there. Um, so watering deeply enough, you may end up watering less frequently, but um, you wanna make sure you're getting all the way down through the roots. Um, if you're watering less frequently, say you're watering heavily, I don't know, say three days a week, um, that might not be enough for the shallow rooted uh, lettuce. You know, So this, the top soil starts to dry out a little bit. So you may have to hand water some of those plants. Um, on those in-between days. And this is a great picture that it's a, I think it's a meadow land that, um, this has been going around the internet for years, this picture. And it shows the diversity of plants that you can have and the diversity of root systems. And so, some roots can go down very deep and some roots are, are relatively shallow. It's great when you, when you cut those plants off to leave that organic matter in the soil to decompose and continue to feed the soil. 
just as an example, this little brushwork over here on the side, that's your typical turf lawn. So it is uh, three or four inches high, maybe six inches deep. And uh, that's the extent of, uh, of uh, the system, the, the lawn system in the soil. Okay, so the next point we wanted to cover was keeping the soil covered and that's adding mulch. And I apologize in advance to our Q&A guys. We kind of joke, uh, we start talking about mulch, the mulch hits the fan on the questions. Um, so <laughs> here we go. Uh, but he here's a couple different kinds of mulch. We do um, straw at our garden, we buy it by the bale. And it's really easy to use uh, that way. And um, uh, we just fluff it up a good two or three inches deep around the plants. Here we got a bunch of pepper plants. In the middle is uh, what I've done at home for years, which is I get, a, I get a lot of leaves in the fall. And so I, I save them in big wire bins and I'll crumple those and use those mulch. And that only really takes about an inch of those to cover the soil well and moderate the temperature and keep the moisture in. Um, and another thing you can do is use wood chips. So it presents a very tidy appearance. Um, can be a little bit of a nuisance in, uh, in raking that off after you're done. Um, you don't wanna turn it into the soil because it will actually kind of suck the nitrogen out of the soil if it, if it's, if it gets buried. So it, say you're gonna top dress that bed after those tomato plants come out. Um, you would rake off that um, that uh, those wood chips and then top dress the soil and then the wood chips go back over. The leaves actually kind of decompose and are, are really kind of gone by the end of the summer season. And the, uh, the straw ends up kind of rolling up like a mat. It's relatively easy to peel off at the end of the season when you wanna address the beds. But here's the difference it can make. Um, this was at our garden. I think it was, I think it was, I did this a year and a half ago. And um, it's all in the same bed. And I, I had an infrared thermometer. It was a day in the high 80s, 85, 87, something like that. And um, I put the thermometer on bare ground, uncovered ground. Um, the thermometer showed 132 degrees. Real, and at 100, 140 organisms start dying, right? That's what you you have to, that's the minimum heat you've got to get when you're cooking something is to get it over 140. Um, so 132 degrees. Even the straw itself was 126 degrees, the picture in the minute in the middle. You brush the soil, you brush the mulch off, and you can see the soil underneath it is is damp, darker than the picture on the right, on the left, and the soil was 75 degrees, which is that, you know, that perfect temperature range you want for, for peppers and tomatoes. So that's the difference that mulching makes. It, it moderates the soil temperature and helps keep moisture in so you're, you're able to water less. So now let's talk a little bit about postseason. So, um, this on the left there is a wine barrel that I had a tomato plant in. And so similar to what we did when we composted in place on that bed at the beginning, I'm doing the same thing with this wine barrel. Uh, I chopped up the tomato plant very small, lots of little bits there. And just as a caveat to this, um, you don't want to be, you don't want to be composting in place disease plants. Um, if, if there's any kind of disease in that tomato plant, um, uh, you need, you want to throw that in your trash, not in the green bin, throw it in the trash. Um, but this was a perfectly healthy plant. And, uh, and so I chopped it up, covered it with compost, uh, 
for a couple of weeks and then planted this broccoli in there. And then there was some other stuff in there. I think I had some thyme in there and these are some little lettuce seedlings. Um, so put in a second crop, just like you, you could do in your beds. Um, and in the middle is uh, a mixed cover crop that uh, you can also put in. This is a picture taken at our garden um, of a variety of mustards and phacelia and I'm not sure what else is in there, ryegrass or something. Um, but a, a mixed cover crop, uh, you could do the same thing in that, in that raised container as you could in the ground. So in summary, uh, in the pre-season, you want to build the soil while disturbing it as little as possible. We don't want to turn it over. We just want to aerate it if necessary and skip that if it doesn't need it. So you're getting less work and less expense, less prep involved there. Um, you want to protect the soil from, in this in season, you want to protect the soil from the elements while providing a diverse variety of plants um, the moisture that they need. So using mulch and water only as needed. And then in the post season, we wanna keep roots in the ground and to keep your soil active and alive. And in the end, you're left with healthier soil, which is going to give you healthier plants and give you healthier produce. And so we'll go to questions in a moment, but, um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Terry. Thank you. I've been trying to keep up with all the questions. <laughs> um, okay, so we just wanna let you know that um, you can access information that we have year round. Um, our website is a, is a great site. Um, you can follow us on social media. Um, from our website, you can find additional webinars. I'll show you a list of those in a minute. And you can also find talks in our garden or when we'll be at um, farmer's markets. Um, we have a help desk, lots and lots of uh, great resources. And you can also find our YouTube channel. All right, next slide. And here is our um, webinar lineup for 2023. Um, so you can see that up next we have um, climate change in your garden. We have a, a, a great talk on um, good bug, bad bug, um, growing herbs and lots of other things. Um, so here's our upcoming schedule. Okay, next slide. Oh, and, and there was our YouTube channel also on the bottom of that slide. Um, you will be getting a survey from um, the University of California in about three months or so. And so we would encourage you to um, fill that out when you have a chance um, just to uh, help out the university system um, in trying to figure out um, what their goals and objectives are. Thank you. And then the next slide. Okay, so this slide here um, is basically sharing with you that we have a handout for you that has some resources available. In order to get the handout, um, what you can do is uh, click on the link you see on the, um, uh, the, the, click on this QR code that you see in front of you or there's a link in the chat. And this will take you to a very brief survey um, from the, uh, on the talk that Greg just did. And when you finish the survey um, and you complete it, on the thank you page, um, there is a link to the handout. And so that's how you can get the handout from today's talk. And, um, the next thing we're going to do is go to questions. And we know um, we've got some of those lined up. 
So let me go there. Okay. Um, so there were some questions about um, how is it that you incorporate um, amendments or organic material into your bed without tilling? And I think there might be a little confusion about no-till versus um, low-till. And um, so we would like you to talk about that a little bit more, Greg. Yep. Um, yeah, I actually, I realized I didn't mention no-till much. In that. Uh, so um, what, what we've evolved into is to put our compost on top of the soil and let the organisms come and get it, just as it would happen in nature. You don't see a forest that needs to be have material tilled into it. Um, you don't see meadows that need material tilled into it. Um, and so we're doing the same thing in our garden beds where we're, we're letting the earthworms and the nematodes and the millipedes and centipedes and and pill bugs and all those guys come and get the 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 organic matter and pull it down into the soil and they will do that um, I don't know if anyone else has seen this in their garden but at my beds at home I've got pebbles that suddenly pop to the surface they've been pushed up from deep in the ground they're not they're not in the top of my beds and they've been pushed up from deep in the ground by earthworms activities and other activities. And actually my, my beds were the debris site for an addition we put on the house 25 years ago. And for 25 years, I've had random nails still being pushed up through the soil. So um, we let it happen naturally. Right. Okay. And, um... The, another question was, how, where where is it that you can uh, get burlap bags for composting in place? Yeah, so um, we there's a number of coffee roasters around the Bay Area, and you can just look them up, and they're happy to get rid of their bags. We've been we've been getting them from a coffee roaster in Benicia. And we've, we've actually kind of talked it up so much that um, the bags have gotten hard to get there. <laughs> so um, we have to kind of reserve, cause we get them a pallet at a time and we have to kind of reserve a couple of weeks in advance to, to be able to get them anymore. So I would, I would check with coffee roasters. I see some places selling them. You don't need to buy them. If you, if you shop around and look for, look for local coffee roasters in the East Bay or North Bay, um, you can get them there and, and they, they're they happy to get rid of them usually. Right. Okay, and another, um, some questions came up about uh, soil probes. And yeah. um, one question was, how often should, should I use a soil probe in the, in the garden? Is it, is it weekly or monthly? Um, I think your plants can be a good indicator of that. If, if your plants look great, you're probably watering well. And if they don't look great, you could be underwatering, you could be overwatering. The symptoms can look actually kind of similar. Both can droop, both can turn yellow. Um, so uh, if your plants look great, you're probably doing okay. And if, if they don't look great, um, uh, I, would, I would probe. We, I mean, we, we do it every week randomly between the 30 beds. Okay. You know, we'll check, check four or five beds a week. Okay. And another question came up about where to have soil tested. Um, someone else uh, put an answer in that um, was a link to a UC a r list of soil labs. And so I'm not sure. Um, That's one of the where... links. That's that's one of the links on my handout. Is oh, great. The, 
and it may be the same link. There, there's four or five labs that we don't we don't endorse anybody, but that's four or five labs that will check rec residential soil for you. Okay, great. Um, another question came up about uh, using homemade compost or worm compost. Um, you know, kind of what sort of compost is is um, recommended pluses and minuses of these compost. I mean, the, the, the best stuff is going to be stuff you can make at home if you're able to do that, um, because you've got, you know, exactly what goes in it. You buy you buy compost even in bulk. Um, and there's then there's a number of great resources around the, around the, the Tri-Valley area for it, everywhere from revision recycle or vision recycling up in Martinez to Eco Mulch, to American Soils in Emeryville, to uh, Sloat in Danville, to um, uh, Voss in Dublin, to the other Vision Recycling location in Livermore. There's lots of places you can buy it, and those are all decent resources. But given the choice, I, I I, I tend to prefer using my own. Okay. And as, as far as, as, far as uh, worm, using uh, worm castings, that's just another amendment you can add in there. They add a little something. They don't add a lot of the, of the primary nutrient, nutrients. I think they're typically rated like 0 0.6, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 something like that um but it's 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 usually not it, it it is something that will help the soil some okay how about uh cover crops when is the best time to plant cover crops um anytime you need to put something in the ground that you're not going to eat <laughs> so <laughs> uh um so what we'll do at the garden is we're not going to plant every bed for fall. And, you know, cause we're only going to pick so much kale and broccoli and uh, whatever we're going to do in the fall. Um, and, but we want something in every bed. And so anytime you, you would be leaving the bed empty, good thing to do is to plant a cover crop in it. And, and what we do is you can, you can buy online these mixed seed packages. Studies have kind of shown that the, the, the greater variety you put in there, like it's the same diversity conversation with planting what you eat, that the more variety you get in there, the, the better off it's going to be. So we usually do seed mixes that might have six or eight different seeds in there. Can be fava beans, can be bell beans, can be different mustards rye, phacelia, it can be all kinds of different things. They all have different root structures and they all, they're all going to add uh, to the soil. Great. And um, one on, um, where do you buy straw for mulch? And maybe you can just comment that um, it's important to use straw rather than, than hey, we, we don't want any seeds, right? Right, right. Um, and it's it's it doesn't mean you'll never get seeds, but ideally you want to use straw because hay does have seeds in it. Straw is not supposed to, but um, you know we get a few plants coming up at our garden. And you go, hey, you know what? That looks like rice. We didn't plant rice. <laughs> um, and and so you can buy it by the bale as we do, a, one bale goes a long way. They're super compressed. Um, we'll do our whole garden with about a bale and a half. But say you've got just one six by eight bed, you can get um, you can get bags of straw as well. So because these feed stores will sell it, you know, for your hamster or your chickens or where you wouldn't want a whole bale. Right. All right. Well, we have um, 
some other questions here. Um, I'm seeing some thank you comments and some things um, that are related to pests and um, kind of some other other issues. So I'm wondering if this might be a good time for us to wrap. Okay. Um, so I think with that, we can close and uh, we encourage everyone to um, take the, uh, the little survey that we have, get the handout, look at the resources, um, check out our other resources online, um, attend other webinars, and um, you know, we're there for you, um, our help desk and um, at other events um, to help you with your with your questions. And and Greg, do, would you like to say anything in closing? No, just thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. And we feel free to stop by um, our garden or stop by our demonstration gardens that we're out there one day a week at each of them. And that, that's available online. Yeah, and that's a really good place to see things in action. Thank you. Okay, right, thank well, you. Have a good evening. Thanks, everyone.